through today's broadcast of North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of NIC television students and your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist Tony Stewart. As we approach next Tuesday's election for President and Vice President of the United States, along with many other offices, on this program we are very fortunate to have a, a great expert on this subject to discuss next Tuesday with us and also the Office of the Presidency. I welcome to the program Mr. Mel Elfin, who is the editor of Special Reports at the United States News and World Report, and he is currently editing the magazine's National News section. He joined U.S. News uh, in 1986 after a 28-year career with Newsweek magazine. And I can also report that almost 20 years of that time was spent as bureau chief uh, with Newsweek, in which is a Washington record uh, for longevity in such a high-level editorial position. Our guest comes to us with great expertise on the presidency. In fact, he has privately interviewed the last five presidents of the United States uh, for his work in journalism. He also was accompanying President Richard Nixon to the People's Republic of China in 1972, and also that year went to the Soviet Union with the president. Uh, recently, he has been the editor of two books, one entitled Oliver North and the other one, A Guide to America's Best Colleges. Mr. Elfin, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to Idaho and to this program. I look forward to the interview. Well, I, I've been in Idaho for one hour and I'm already on television. My first trip, I think that's a record. I've never happened to anybody in the state before. <laughs> and it's my understanding that this is the 49th uh, state that you've been 49th state I've been to and I'm, I'll make the other one. I won't give competition credit, but uh, I really am honored to be here and particularly to be at the College of North Idaho uh, coming as we are just before the election. Well, thank you. And it's always it's a great pleasure to have regular panelist, Idaho State Senator Mary Lou Reed, and I shall ask Senator Reed to commence the questioning. Thank you, Tony. And Mel, let me offer my welcome, too. It's wonderful to have you here. I'm curious about how many presidential campaigns you have followed from a reporter's standpoint. From when a reporter's standpoint, I, the first one was in 56, but that was a local. I was just working on a local newspaper. I started covering presidential elections on a national uh, framework beginning in the Kennedy election of 1960. So how many does that make? Uh, and you've been it's a lot of elections. Ever since, have you actually gone on the campaign trail? Yeah. Uh, I started out as one of the boys on the bus, and now I look around and I find that uh, it used to be my children. Now it looks like my grandchildren are on the boys and girls. Now it's the boys and girls on the bus. Why don't you tell us a little bit what it's like to be on that bus or plane or whatever it is. What's the routine? Well, I can imagine what it must be. It's If I were uh, an animal in the zoo, I, I get an understanding of what it must be like by being a member of the, it's a uh, cage of the press that's corps. It's, it's really caged a Caged animals. Kid. And the candidate's staff feed the animals every once in a while with little nuggets of information. Uh, a great camaraderie builds up um, during the Carter campaign. A number of marriages came out of uh, the campaign. A lot of camaraderie. A lot of camaraderie, super camaraderie. Uh, and some minor understanding of the political process and of the candidates. The problem with the political campaigns today, it's no longer uh, a device to, oh, impart information or, or set up that wonderful word vision of, about the country. It's uh, a series of uh, media opportunities. It's a series of um, MTV shots, uh, very rapid moving. Who can get in front of the best patriotic background? And on the same day that uh, Michael Dukakis went into the gun factory in Michigan, George Bush was in the flag factory somewhere. Symbol, and symbols. Symbols, we live, uh, I've, I, I agree, we live in symbols. I mean, I, I love symbols, it's terrific. I cry with symbols. But uh, the political campaign should be about more than uh, who can appear in the most pictures, most patriotic pictures. This was an art, it was begun in a sense by Kennedy. And I think it uh, has been magnified now to such an extraordinary extent, it's overwhelmed all sense of, of discussion and intelligence and what have you. And Mike Deaver in the first term of, of Ronald Reagan was, I mean, that mastered it was government through media photo opportunity. You couldn't think of um, a, a scenic place, maybe here in Coeur d'Alene, that the president hadn't been to. Uh, and that's one of 
what, what it's all come down to. The President of the United States can go out and pose in front of Mount Rushmore and recite, Mary had a little lamb, and people will not notice what he said, but they will, they will notice the background. Well, this is frustrating then from the standpoint of the newsman. You don't, you're, you're only fed what you, they want to feed you, and then what can you then impart to your readers or to the viewers that uh, they couldn't get uh, from somebody Political else? Political campaigns, well, I mean, are not de they're not designed for somebody in the print media. I mean, let's, one of the things to understand, there's an extraordinary difference between television and the print media. We're in a different business. I mean, when you say, when we're all, uh, let's say, tarred with the same brush, uh, the campaign is designed for television. It's not designed for me. So I uh, can stand back and take a, uh, a longer range view. I can afford not to uh, uh, worry about today's gaffe, and they're always going to be today's, or today's split in the staff, or today's phone call from uh, a candidate to another candidate. Uh, I have to take a more interpretive view, stand back, um, broader view, more historic, and that's one of the nice things about having gray hair. You can, you've already, just stand back, you already have a long view. And I, uh, even if you get on the bus and they call you grandpa, uh, it, it's, a, it's a benefit. Uh, Mr. Elfin, I would like to talk a little bit about 1988, because that's on everyone's mind since we're just on the almost eve of the election. The polls have indicated that there's been a very high negative rating this year. Uh, Bush particularly started out with one of the highest negative ratings of an incumbent vice president. The Dukakis was lower, but then it has come, become a very high uh, rating also. And also it seems to be that from a political science viewpoint that this is the largest percentage of the electorate that is unsure of how they may vote or they are very uh, mildly committed to a candidate. Why do you think this year has produced those kind of results? Because I think you have two candidates without passion. I'm not even going to use the word, Greek word charisma. Let's, let's leave that aside. Kennedys come along very rarely in our politics. But they are men without passion. They are, uh, if they were the Soviet Union, they'd be called apparatchiks, operators. They're people who've come up through the, through the system without displaying any, any real visceral feel for human beings. Uh, and that's the first thing. The second thing is, I think we've reached a stage in our political development where people are wising up to the presidency. That it, it's not all that important anymore. That the country itself is bigger than its presidents and it doesn't depend, our future doesn't depend on who gets elected president. I passed through uh, an airport and there was a big sign from CNN, one of uh, a rival network, and it said America, the most important election in American history. And I looked at it twice and I looked at it the season I had read it correctly and I just, I kept muttering to myself, nonsense, 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 nonsense. Our lives will go on, uh, we will find for all the differences between the two candidates that they're all not that far apart. Presidential politics is now a game played between the 40 yard lines. And uh, the ideological differences that once were apparent, and they were apparent, I don't say they were real, uh, are far less than they ever were. And uh, whoever gets elected in January is going to have to face the same set of problems and the range of answers to those problems are very small. So take those two things, the, the personalities of the candidates themselves and the fact that it doesn't matter as much anymore and people are wising up. I think these are the reasons why you have that sense of, I mean, this has got to be one of the, uh, no, not, not got to be, it is the dullest election I've ever seen. And I go back to the time I was covering local races for, should pardon the expression, state legislature. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't get me, I covered the state legislature in New York for uh, a number of years and had more <laughs> fun there than I did in covering the Congress. You got closer to people. And it, it, the other thing probably is the remoteness of, from uh, the, the, the people. I mean, uh, you don't get to see except through that remoteness of the, of the television tube. You don't get to feel the candidates. You don't get to feel, I didn't even see bumper stickers anymore. I mean, I've never seen as few bumper stickers. You get more bumper stickers for lo local restaurants and, and, and local colleges. I mean, I see more bumper stickers in Washington 
uh, not because of you, but I will say, you know, if, if God weren't a Tar Heel, why did he make the sky Carolina blue? I've seen more <laughs> of those than I see for quail or, 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 or bush or dukakis or benson. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Reed. Well, when you say, uh, let's follow up on this, when you say the presidency doesn't matter anymore, are you suggesting that nobody's in charge? No, no. I say that it doesn't make, I should have phrased it differently. That much difference way. between the between two. The it makes, two. sure it makes some difference of, in minor ways, in symbolic ways. It is an incredible bully pulpit. It remains the power, uh, you have the power to rouse, to motivate, to establish the, the communion with the people. But uh, just let's just take an example. Supposing this were the fall of 1980, and you had two candidates out there, including the most conservative man to run for the presidency in 60 years. And suddenly, we had all locked ourselves away in <coughs> some magical kingdom here. Maybe we, if this town seceded from the rest of the world, we'd get any newspapers to tell me nothing. And eight years later, we re-entered the political fray. And I were to tell you that the man who got elected concluded a nuclear arms reduction treaty with the Soviet Union for intermediate weapons, was about to do one for strategic, long-range strategic weapons, that the New Deal was totally intact, there was no abortion reform laws, the government was larger uh, after eight years and the day he started, and that he had piled up the biggest deficit uh, combined and then all the other presidents in the history of the country combined. And you would have said to me, and how is that, dear President Mondale? But I'm giving you the record of Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't, I don't say that because Ronald Reagan was insincere. He is a sincere conservative. But Ronald Reagan is constrained by the Congress of the United States, the Supreme Court of the United States. We do have a constitution. Constrained by the press, constrained by uh, Gaddafi, Khomeini, con con constrained by an economy. Hamilton Jordan once told me, he said, what could we do? He came into office and oil was $8 a barrel. We left oil was $35 a barrel. We, we couldn't control it. So the forces that control our lives, determine our uh, health, happiness, et cetera, uh, are centered outside of Washington. I mean, to me, what goes on uh, in Silicon Valley or the high-tech centers in this state or the high-tech centers around Denver uh, or around Boston, that's where the future of the United States is going to be. If we, How competitive can we be? The President of the United States doesn't determine that. The President of the United States doesn't even determine the shape of the immediate economy. We had the worst recession in 1982 and 83 that we've had since the Great Depression. And who caused that? Not Ronald Reagan. It was Paul Volcker. And who appointed Paul Volcker? Jimmy Carter. Uh, so when you look at the, the, the things that constrain a president, uh, you would have to say, this is not a very powerful man. The, so the, the president is to some extent in a, in a, in a box, but look at what... Uh, Reagan has been able to do in terms of the deficit. That is not. Uh, oh sure, that's but not, uh, oh yes, but he did that even though he was campaigning for a a, a balanced budget, et cetera. Uh, he did that because uh, that was the origins of the deficit. Another television show. I hope you invite me back for. But um, <laughs> he did it. But he did it with the with the uh, con a conspiracy of the Congress too. I mean, the Congress could have done something about it. And, the problem is that I think with the growth of television, we, we don't have the presidents we had, presidency we had when I started out. It's now what I call the electronic presidency. And we have sort of the expectations we have, plus a star system. And we've made of our presidents sort of a, a phrase I use is a combination of Rambo, Redford, and Mother Teresa. Uh, we expect mm -hmm. that kind of quality in the man, and yet, um, you know, when you pull that curtain aside, what do you have? You have a Frank Morgan-like creature pumping dr uh, smoke and playing the drums and hoping that nobody discovers he's like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And yet we expect, this is the paradox of American uh, democracy, we expect the president to be a great wizard. And then when it turns out he's just like everybody else, we're so disappointed. And that's one of the things that, uh, uh, the paradox, in a sense, well, of what we, what we really want in people. This may be a little bit like Santa Claus. It's very hard for me to really accept that it doesn't make a difference uh, who is elected president. Uh, certainly in terms of, of the Supreme Court, we... we well, this I said all that much difference. It might make a difference mm -hmm. in the court. Uh, it might make a difference, say, obviously in the... Uh, 
those Democrats on the court who, who, who promised not to die until as a Democrat uh, in the White House may have to go on living, but uh, the actuarial tables are against them. I dare say that George Bush, if elected president of the United States, will revert to type. And I think that George Bush is a uh, kind of a Jerry Ford moderate, somewhat to the, he plays the game within the 40 yard lines, and we will not get uh, extreme conservative judges from a George Bush. Uh, I really don't think. I mean, George, when I first met George Bush, he was pro-choice. And I think Barbara Bush was clamming up about it. I think she's pro-choice, too. But uh, remember how Bush changed after the nomination in, in, in New Orleans. Ronald Reagan came on Monday night in New Orleans and made a speech, and nobody could hear it. It was a terrible acoustical situation. And people thought he was going to, that Bush would be overshadowed by Reagan. Reagan was a bombed in a sense. Not for anything he did, but because of the technical things. Bush became his own man. It was almost he was liberated on uh, Thursday night when he made his speech. I think if he, if he is elected and raises his right hand on, uh, or puts his right hand on the Bible on uh, uh, January 20th, 1989, we're going to see a new George, an, an old new George Bush. I think he will... Uh, Revert kind to type is, yeah. is the phrase you're using. Yeah, I think that uh, it's like, uh, you know people do grow and change. I thank thank heaven, but uh, I've known George Bush since uh, he came to the Congress in that uh, great Republican class of 1966, and he he mixed it up with some of the uh, Republican liberals in that in that class. There were a number of Republican liberals in that class. That, um, he was not uh, his record. Go back and look at his record. Uh, I mean, he's coming, right now he's staking out positions on the environment, for example, that are to the left of uh, Dukakis on, on the issues of Boston Harbor cleaning up. Uh, he will surprise. Is Dukakis, does Dukakis fit into the same um, reflex then, that if he is uh, elected president, he will not be I think be so. I think Dukakis from? will not be as left wing as, as we've come to expect from s some people from Massachusetts. Or as he's being painted. Or as he's being painted. Um, People do learn. I um, and and Dukakis has got an awful lot to learn. I I just wonder about a man who gets to be 54 years old and has never been to London or Paris and has been in public life that long. Uh, he is uh, a, a a great learning curve ahead. And uh, you know I saw this with Jimmy Carter, who had uh, and Jim Carter was more broadly based uh, in a sense. Uh, it takes a while. You come in with certain ideas and uh, the system beats you down after a while. Uh, he'll bring in a different kind of person than Bush will, maybe more professorial in a way. We'll have more, more Harvard. Uh, but I think that uh, we'll, he'll play it within the 40-yard lines. We're not going to have a Willie Horton situation. Uh, we're not going to have uh, demo grants of George McGovern. We're not going to go crawling on our knees to Hanoi uh, if he is elected uh, on election day on Tuesday. I think uh, we can look forward to a, a moderate but very dull time. I ask you this question with the realization that it was taped uh, on October the 12th and is not airing until uh, early November, but uh, let's talk about what you've called the Willie Horton, Dan Quayle factors in this election. And if you'd explain to our viewers what you mean by that. and uh, it, it What I mean is that this people will decide, a lot of times they decide on negatives. Mm -hmm. And they've already made up their minds, I think, that Bush and Dukakis don't interest them. And the passion that could be aroused, that kind of, uh, the hot button, as we say, can be over the Stan Quayle in the White House prospect of make you more nervous than Willie Horton out in the streets. Willie Horton, of course, was the uh, famous prisoner who was let out on furlough and then went down from Massachusetts to Maryland and committed a violent rape and a murder and now back in jail. Uh, he was let out on a, under a Dukakis program. People get excited by that. They got excited at the convention in New Orleans. I mean, they were really out there uh, talking about Willie Horton on one side. Quayle had an impact in that, in that debate in early October. He really did. I uh, talked to a lot of folks and a lot of Republicans, a lot of Republican office holders who were made very nervous by Dan Quayle and not by a question of his National Guard service or anything like that, but a question of is, is he intellectually up to it. 
Now, we've learned that you can be a very good president and not be intellectually up to it. Ronald Reagan still gets everything he knows out of index cards. Um, and he, if it hadn't been for Iran Contra, could have, been, could have gone down as a, you know, a near great president and that Harry Truman level. He blew it. Uh, so, and Ronald Reagan, no one is ever accused of being a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, but so you don't have to have that kind of thing. But the prospect of somebody with that kind of, um, oh, people have said he's a spoiled kid. I mean, I've heard that phrase in Washington. So that versus Horton, you choose up sides. Which one bothers you more? I have a question uh, about advertising. Uh, and am I correct that the, the Bush staff has been more uh, shrewd at advertising than the Dukakis staff? Because it is true that George Bush has some connections with halfway houses in Houston or President Reagan had a similar policy as governor of California. Why have the Republicans been able to uh, zero in on Willie Horton, but the Democrats have not been successful you showing see, In, the, in the military, side. what you do is seize the high ground, yeah. and whoever gets there first. Uh, because it was, uh, again, you, we're living by perceptions, you're living by symbols, and this was a very brutal kind of a symbolic thing, and it sort of summed up uh, uh, summed up a situation, a kind of a goo-gooism, as we say in Washington, a, a do-goody kind of attitude toward crime that you 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 blame the victim sort of thing, and uh, the Republicans seized that and they seized it brilliantly. I saw it in, in I, I said, again. I said I saw it in the convention, and uh, on the other hand, Dukakis tries to play the ethnic roots. I mean, I, I don't want to hear about his immigrant. Uh, parents anymore because uh, his immigrant father went to Harvard and went to Harvard Medical School and became a doctor. It wasn't exactly hand-to-mouth living, as most Im immigrant families had to contend with in this country. Uh, so they, look, political advertising is political advertising. That's one of the great traditions in American life. It goes back to being born in a log cabin. Uh, we, you know, you have slogans. That, that's fine. That's, that's the game. That's the way you play it. I, uh, I can remember the slogan, I mean, the best one I've, I've ever heard was the Republican slogan for Congress in 1946 when they took over the Congress after World War II, which is just two words on the bumper stickers. Had enough? Boom. That's all you have to, you have to know. I take it also from what you're saying that if both sides have maybe the same issue, whichever one uh, captures that first, the other side can And manages never... to find the symbol. Yeah. I mean, I, and once you start to explain in more than 25 words, you're finished. Mm -hmm. I can tell you the Willie Horton story in about 15 and oh, George Bush was associated with uh, halfway houses and Reagan when he was governor. That takes a lot of explaining. Uh, you've got to sum it up quickly. I mean, I, we come back to this MTV images, and it's got to go boom, boom, boom. And uh, with Dukakis's films, you can go boom, 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 just as you sum it up. I mean, I can give you the words dealing, selling arms to the Ayatollah. I mean, I got you. There's another one right there. I can play that one too. The Ayatollah is a hate figure. So you you know you can measure that against Willie Horton. Uh, the, the, the line around about quail in Washington now is you know it isn't so much a question of whether what would happen to Dan Quayle if something were to go wrong with George Bush. It's a question of what would happen to Mike Dukakis if something would go wrong with Lloyd Benson. Uh, Benson is a uh, you know so many among the Democrats that they would like to have the ticket reversed. They wouldn't be a much better ticket, they would say, if it were Benson and running for president, and Dukakis for vice president, then with more enthusiastic support for the ticket. Uh, again, that's some of it. It's probably Washington prejudice. We, uh, we are very insular, and we think we have all the wisdom in the world, and uh, Lloyd is a, uh, uh, a resident uh, uh, captain of uh, a team, and uh, we all know him, and uh, uh, he speaks the same language. He also happens to be uh, rather bright somewhat patrician style uh, and uh, got a hell of a backhand too I can tell you it, uh, Lloyd's almost 70 and what it was 68 and he just really plays a terrific game of tennis uh, so he's one of quote one of us he's one of the boys yeah. you know and George Bush kept going around the campaign when he's with every state was I'm, I'm one of you <laughs> and uh, uh, there is that sort of thing that uh, I would suspect that if you went down the uh, uh, Washington insiders list Benson they, they vote for Benson of the four century well what kind of economy is this next president going to inherit on the face of it everything looks pretty prosperous is that a genuine picture pretty good yeah there'll be some decisions being made I believe them both when they say that uh, 
you know, George Bush says, read my lips, I'm not going to raise taxes. Although I was standing behind him, so I couldn't read his lips. I just, you know. <laughs> uh, and Dukakis says, he'll do it as a last resort. I, uh, we're going to be pretty good right into the last half of next year, I would suspect. Uh, the b business and the export trade booming. Uh, I think we're going to have a good year in uh, automobiles this coming year. So uh, the problems on the deficit can be solved not by major fixes. I, both of them can, can talk about uh, revenue enhancement as opposed to taxes. So therefore, you can come up with a, uh, a gasoline tax, uh, a tax on cigarettes or uh, whiskey, so-called sin. And of course, the problem with that is both uh, consumption of cigarettes and uh, alcohol going down, so you're not going to raise as much money as you want to. So I, I would suspect that the energy thing might be the best uh, way the Congress will go. There is going to be some kind of a tax increase in the 1989 Congress, but I don't think it's going to be income tax increase. They work too hard and let it slip away too many times. I mean, if somebody wanted to uh, play around with raising rates now, uh, Bob Packwood of Oregon would, uh, I think, go through the right out the window. He just he spent devoted six months or a year of his life to the tax reform in, in 1986, and he's not about to open up the window again. So we're yeah we're in good shape, and I don't think there'll be that much of a difference. Uh, the deficit, the uh, budget deficit is less of a problem than the uh, trade deficit is going to be. Yeah, we don't have a lot of time left, but uh, in looking at both. Vice President Bush and Governor Dukakis, uh, some of the image we, we've seen come forth, do they both have uh, more strength than shows? Uh, and we, we know they don't have charisma and so forth. Uh, how, how would you perceive them in, in crisis? You don't survive what they both survive. They both have terrible personal tragedies. Dukakis lost the devoted brother. George lost a child. Uh, you. You know, you, you come through, your, like the human organism uh, gets a little flu shot, you take a little shot of flu, you're stronger. And I think both of them are personally stronger. And politically, you lose, they both lost races, they both suffered defeat. I think people, adversity toughens people. And I would have, I, I could rest easily with both of them. And I, uh, I go back to that wonderful line in the 19th century American humorist. And I believe it today as it was. In 1898, God takes care of drunks, fools, little children in the United States of America. With that, we bring the program to a conclusion. On behalf of Senator Reed and our staff, uh, Mr. Elfman, we thank you so much. It's been most informative. It's been great having you as a guest. My pleasure to be in Idaho. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that Come you back. will join all of us uh, next Tuesday in voting for the candidates of your choice, and we hope you've enjoyed our program. I invite you to be with us again next week at the same time. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at the same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by an NIC student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.